All right, Congressman Crowley, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank and out you. front now with me, the former director of the Nixon Presidential Library, our presidential historian, Tim Naftali, and Nick Ackerman, former assistant U.S. attorney, former assistant special Watergate prosecutor. So, Nick, let me start with you. You know, part of what I'm trying to understand tonight, I think all right. of our viewers are, a lot of people were calling for this. But sometimes people call for something, and it may or may not matter. Okay, so we now have the special counsel. What does it mean? You've been there. How significant is this? What's he going to do? I think this is extremely significant. Yeah. It means that there's going to be an, a person in charge of this investigation who is independent, that's not mm -hmm. beholden to the attorney general, who's not beholden to the administration, who has an excellent reputation. And he's Even though, obviously, Rod Rosenstein, who was a Trump appointee, appointed him. There is still a very clear independence. Yeah, and I think, and, and I think it's, it's set up just yeah. like he was a U.S. attorney. That is, that he makes the final decisions on what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, Rosenstein could come in and, and, and reverse those decisions, but it's very unlikely. I think that he's going to have complete independence here. This is very similar to what was done with Cox, not quite as independent. Uh, but if you look at what the release was tonight, it's clear that he's not only going to be able to investigate what went on with the Russian collusion and whether there was any collusion with Russia, but he's also going to be able to investigate all crimes arising from that. So that means that any issues about obstruction of justice by the president are also going to come within his purview, which is very significant. Right, because we don't yet know, Tim, where the borders are. It could include any, anything on this list or something that no one's even thought of or is aware of at this time. Sure. Well, we saw that with Whitewater, didn't we, in the 1990s? Right. Uh, that's, what, that's what Jeff was just pointing out. You start there, and you ended up with Monica Lewinsky. This, we've just entered a new chapter of this story. Uh, uh, Mr. Mueller understands uh, the law. Mr. Mueller ran the FBI so well that a Democratic president asked him to stay longer than his 10-year term. Right. Two years under two years. Barack Obama. Okay. This exactly. Is, so this is a man uh, of, of great personal probity. This is a man who's greatly respected. Mm-hmm. He now has subpoena power. He, there was always a question as to whether the House or the Senate would use their subpoena power to investigate the Russia, the Russia hacking and collusion scandal. Now we have someone with a great deal of professional ethics who has subpoena power. This is a very different investigation now. This is a serious investigation, and he can take it wherever he feels it ought to go. So the whole game has changed, and now it's a serious matter. And uh, I'll say this, um, until the Comey memos came out, um, this wasn't really about President Trump. President Trump now is at the center of this particular inquiry. In large measure, it's because of the way he handled Comey. And Robert Mueller, a man who loves the FBI and is mm -hmm. committed to its reputation, is the best person to find out why Mr. Comey kept those records and what those records really mean. Right, because we know that Mr. Comey says he kept them because he was appalled or concerned at what the president was saying. Correct. I, I will say, frankly, we have not yet gotten through the leaks, because he hasn't yet chosen to come out and speak, we have not yet gotten a good answer as to why he didn't share that information with anyone until after he was fired. Correct. I mean, yeah. that, that's the big question. And also, what do these memos actually look like? I mean, no one has seen the memos. Right. We haven't read them. We haven't heard no. his testimony. We haven't heard his explanations. So, yeah, there's more to uncover here. But I think the most important point is that the person uncovering it is going to be somebody that people have confidence in, that it's not going to get slid under the rug, that this mm -hmm. is not going to be a cover-up, and that this will be investigated and we will get to the bottom mm -hmm. of what happened. And we don't know, though, Tim, we're not going to be getting updates. I mean, I think one of the interesting things here, when you look at the fact that you're going to have the House and Senate continuing, at least as of yeah. now, they want, they're going to continue with their investigations. We hear things that are happening in those investigations. Are we going to hear things coming from Bob Mueller's investigation, or is it really going to be leak-free and silent until all of a sudden here's your revelation of nothing or something completely new or whatever it might be? Well, if, if you accept the proposition that it's going to be a serious investigation, mm -hmm. then we don't need to know uh, about it as it goes along because... You know something? Because there's no the, fear of political partisanship. Well, but, 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 but no, the, the, no, here's my yeah. concern. One of the ways that the Nixon administration got ahead of the cover-up, got ahead of the investigation, was that they figured out where it was going because they had, they had sources in the Justice Department. The, if, there are, if there are culpable people here, they shouldn't know what direction the investigation is going in. 
And that's one reason why we don't necessarily need leaks. If you accept the proposition that Mueller will run in a professional investigation, and I yeah. do. So, so uh, let me ask you, because obviously Mueller's going to have the ability here to go ahead with criminal charges. He's got all these powers, okay? But that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Let's just take obstruction of justice, which, which it, it, you know, right. is not explicitly part of this, but could, but could become. That is not something easy to prove. It is incredibly difficult to prove. Well, Mr. Trump has made it a lot easier to prove than one could have imagined. I mean, first of all, people have been focusing on the memo that, that Comey created. But the mm -hmm. fact of the matter is, if you look at all of the circumstances surrounding this, the fact that he didn't fire um, this national security director until 18 days after he was warned, yeah. the fact that the next day he meets with Comey uh, and, right. and, and, and it has this conversation with him about not going after uh, Flynn, uh, and then firing Comey and coming up with this pretextual memo. I mean, right. all of these circumstances would certainly so, provide probable cause of obstruction of justice. I mean, again, it is a crime of intent, and so that right. has to be proven. But right now, there is probable cause that there you was obstruction. Tim, Tim, to this question, though, of the friendship between Mueller and Comey, is, is, is it relevant in that context of the fact that when it comes to these memos, you may end up in a situation, at least you are right now, unless there's some kind of recording, which the president's indicated maybe there is, but it seems to be a big bluff, that you're going to have Jim Comey's word versus that of the president of the United States. Yeah, that's what so I'm So then expecting. you're going to have Bob Mueller to say, well, who does he believe more? Right? I mean, is it possible that, I mean, obviously there's a lot of other avenues of inquiry, but in that specific one, it's going to come down to a judgment call, perhaps who you know better or who you... Well, but I think any good investigation is going to ferret that out and try mm -hmm. and determine what corroborates Comey, what else is there. Look, right. at, there's plenty of other FBI agents yep. that Comey spoke to after he met with the president. I mean, the reason that see these things... see what they all have to say. Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of... you build a better of, case, you do a lot more right. So this research. is yeah. more than just determining whether the Comey memos are enough for obstruction of justice. Yep. He's going to be looking at relationships between, if there were any, between the Trump campaign and the Russians. He's going to be looking at that whole complex of issues. The Comey memos are just a piece of the puzzle. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you both very much. I want to get back to Pamela Brown because this major development of the special uh, counsel, the special prosecutor, coming just 24 hours after we learned about these memos and that we know that there are now multiple memos, thanks in part to the reporting of you, Pamela. Um, obviously, though, this is, this is crucial here. What, what role these memos will play? That is the big question. Who has seen the memos? Who will look at the memos? We know there's more than just the one we reported on yesterday from that February meeting where uh, President Trump. Trump allegedly told then FBI Director James Comey that he wanted him to stop the Michael Flynn probe. In fact, I'm told uh, through my sources that even after two phone conversations uh, former Director Comey had with the president, he also wrote memos from, that com from those conversations. And I'm told that, that, that there's some interesting uh, information in those memos that, of course, as we know, has yet to come out. Um, and in terms of the in-person meetings that Director Comey, then Director Comey, had with the president, what I'm told is he would immediately write down exactly what happened, everything that happened in the conversation, as soon as he got in his car after the meeting, right away, even before the car took off, because he wanted to make sure that what he wrote was captured and that it was accurate. Um, and he, in fact, sometimes before these meetings, I'm told through sources, he would actually talk with his staff and in a sense rehearse and go over potential questions the president could ask him because there was a level of discomfort uh, coming from James Comey meeting with the president one on one on at least two occasions we know of given the ongoing Russia probe. So he would actually talk with his, with his staff about it and try to come up with answers to possible questions that were not confrontational. And also it was different for James Comey. Uh, in President Obama's era, Aaron, I'm told through a source familiar that President Obama would not meet with James Comey one on one after he became the FBI director because he was trying to keep the two separate, the White House and the FBI, and keep that independence there. And he was worried about the optics of it, An uh, Aaron. All right. Thank you very much, Pamela. Mm -hmm. And, you know, t today, President Trump speaking out for the first time since we learned about the former FBI director's memo. Now, obviously, he's come out with this statement tonight in which he's uh, on the special counsel in which he says, uh, Thor and Investigation will confirm what we already know. There was no collusion between my campaign and any foreign entity. Uh, that, though, was right after he found out about the special counsel. This afternoon, he was at a graduation speech at the U.S. Coast Guard Academy, and he used his opportunity to speak to these graduates to complain about how he's being treated. Look at the way I've been treated lately, especially by the media. No politician in history 
and I say this with great surety, has been treated worse or more unfairly. Our senior White House correspondent Jeff Zeleny is back with me. And Jeff, um, obviously, the president facing mounting questions tonight uh, from the press, but not giving many answers. He's not a neat Aaron, and that gives you a sense of his frame of mind or a window into what uh, he was thinking around noon or so. But boy, everything entirely has changed with this appointment of a special prosecutor. Imagine what he's thinking now if that was his mindset. You know, instead of giving an encouraging speech, as he gave in a commencement address over the weekend, this was filled with grievances, uh, as we just heard there. But as Pamela was just reporting, these memos, so important that the uh, former FBI director was recording in real time, uh, you know, exactly what was happening in these meetings. Now, the White House is still pushing back on those, saying the president absolutely did not have those conversations. This is what White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer said during a briefing as they flew back from that commencement exercise. The president is very clear that the account that was uh, published is not uh, an accurate description of, of, his, of, of how the event occurred. We've made it very clear. The president is very clear uh, that this is not an accurate representation. I think we put out a statement very clearly uh, about the president does not believe that that is an accurate representation. The Secretary of State, the National Security Advisor, and the Deputy National Security Advisor were very clear uh, with their recollection of that meeting. We put out a statement last night very clear what our position was. Well, the word's very clear, certainly uh, something that Sean Spicer wanted to convey there. But, Aaron, I can tell you it is anything but very clear where this is going tonight at the White House. The White House did not want a special prosecutor. We know that because Sean Spicer was asked just 48 hours ago in a briefing. Yep. He said, frankly, there is no reason for that. So tonight, the administration still scrambling here. They were planning on preparing for the next chapter to turn the page here. But, Aaron, this is the third straight night of bad news for this White House. But again, this mm -hmm. uh, development has the most far-reaching effect of all the others so far. Aaron. Absolutely. Jeff Zeleny, thank you very much. And David Sanger's with me, New York Times National Security Correspondent, Selena Zito with The Washington Examiner, and John Avalon, Editor-in-Chief of The Daily Beast. Uh, we have some new breaking news I want to share. This is from Ardana Bash. Two big things here. One, when it comes to whether Jim Comey is going to testify, a senior GOP source telling Dana that now there is a special prosecutor, it is unlikely that James Comey will testify publicly about his memo. So obviously he had been leaning in the direction that we were expecting that testimony. He wanted to speak publicly. They now say this shuts the whole thing down. That's the GOP source uh, to Dana that he will not want to testify in front of Congress. So obviously that is crucial. And then um, this source, and I think this is very interesting, I want to get your reaction to this, John, uh, who has been in regular contact with Rod Rosenstein, telling Dana that Rosenstein was reluctant to engage publicly with Congress because he was so angry and exasperated with the Trump White House. The source believes Rosenstein is throwing Trump, quote, overboard with his special counsel. He was already so upset last week, he was talking about packing his bags and quitting, according to this senior uh, GOP source. And now the deputy attorney general believes by this move for a special prosecutor, he can separate and insulate himself from the White House on all of this. John Avalon, obviously very significant. Um, this is coming from our Dana Bash. It is a senior GOP source. Yeah. Uh, this is one person's rendition, uh, but it is a pretty stark statement about the state of mind of the deputy attorney general. It, it is very stark. And the, and the term overboard is, is obviously completely loaded because this should be about a, a search for truth. It's got to be a process that is outside politics which is why, you know, I think uh, the fact the former FBI director has been picked is, yep. is such a checkmate on a lot of the politics and the power plays in Washington. But the insight that Rod Rosenstein is so frustrated by his treatment by the White House, by his almost scapegoating being used uh, in, in the uh, Comey firing, that if that affected his thinking as well, in advance of the meeting with senators tomorrow, he said, look, I'm going to just do what I think is right. I'm going to pick somebody who is beyond reproach and let the chips fall where they may. It's a statement of declaration of independence from the Deputy Attorney General. And David Sanger, what's the reaction of the President of the United States when he hears uh, how his Deputy Attorney General feels? Again, this GOP source saying Rod Rosenstein was so upset last week at the President of the United States. He was talking about packing his bags and quitting. And uh, this source believes Rosenstein is throwing Trump overboard with this special counsel. Well, you know, when you think about this, Aaron, the president made a series of unforced errors that led him right to this point. Mm. And as you said before in your conversation with Jeff Zeleny, this is exactly where they did not want to be. They have a House and Senate investigation right now that really is beyond their control. And now with the special counsel, not quite the same powers as the special prosecutor has, but 
but uh, certainly Bob Mueller is considered to be a, a very serious independent player. Uh, they've got a, another investigation there they can't control. And then, of course, the third element is what all the press is doing. It's not as if uh, CNN and the New York Times and the Washington Post are going to stop investigating this story. And all of these feed on each other. The revelation of the Comey memo yesterday in the Times uh, by my colleague Mike Schmidt, I think really forced the hand of the Justice Department to go for the special counsel. Selena, what, what is the president going to do, right? We have this statement that clearly was produced by those around him which says uh, that there was no collusion between my campaign and any foreign entity, right? It, 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 it's, it's, it's obviously his sentiment, but it's not his tone and it's not the way he talks. Is he going to be able to hold back and let that speak for this? I mean, they're going to be getting all kinds of questions about this. He is going to be speaking many times uh, to the press over the next few days as he travels overseas. Can he hold back? Well, I mean, that's the big History question, right? I mean, we can... Uh, I, uh, he, here's what I think. I think the smartest thing he could do is sort of what President Bill Clinton did when he was facing um, the impeachment over the Monica Lewinsky um, uh, is, issues. Uh, he went out every day, sort of, hey, had a, he had a special um, uh, press press person with him. He showed that he was doing the work of the American people. You know, he would, he would go to um, community events. He would go to f um, food co-ops. He would, he would just be everywhere. And he, I, I think that that's something that Trump needs to do. He just needs to show that he's doing the, the work of the American people and let the chips fall where they may. Because, yeah. like you said, everything is beyond his control. There's really nothing he can do. And the worst message that he can send is that I'm holding up and angry the best message he can send is i'm just going to still do my job and right. you know let the chips fall where they may but but david sanger here's the thing you know we don't yet know where bob Mueller is going to go with this but it would be a, i think a, a a betting person's bet that he will say let's ask let's say ask for tax returns if, if it goes in that direction then the president fights that how much time does this end up consuming for this white house and this president as he fights disclosing what Bob Mueller wants. Well, there's time, which is a big issue, but what there really is is influence, political influence at home with Congress and influence with his, with his foreign counterparts. If he is viewed as uh, weakened, if he is viewed as insular, uh, foreign leaders are going to pick up on that and they're going to toy with him. You know, it's going to be a much harder issue and it might prompt him to go off into some kind of foreign adventure, we don't know for a fact that it would, to sort of do the distraction. That's what Bill Clinton was charged with, uh, yeah. I don't think accurately, uh, when, he, when he did a bombing uh, in, uh, in uh, Kosovo hmm. and so forth uh, during his administration. Yeah, I mean, it, it, God forbid that national security would be politicized in a context like this, and I mean that seriously, but we also have to recognize the reality, which is we have a president without a poker face. Um, he is he, part of the reason we are in this mess, this self-inflicted wounds, this series of self-inflicted wounds, is that this president can't help but say what's on his mind in decidedly unpresidential ways and tones, whether it's by Twitter or with live mics. That's not going to stop. Um, and to expect otherwise would be the triumph of hope over experience. This is going to get much worse before it gets better. And, Selena, we're already finding out in terms of how fast this is going to move, which we've spent a lot of time talking about this hour. You know, someone said this could take two or three years. Chris Swecker, who's worked uh, with Mueller extensively, said he thought he would rush to do this, not to skip corners, but as quickly as he could to be efficient, to get it done in the next year. We already know tonight now two partners, uh, likely from the law firm where Bob Mueller's coming from, are, are, are quitting to go join him. How quickly do you think he's going to have his team together? I mean, that's, that's pretty quick. You already got two people joining tonight. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's going to be a very swift process. And, and I, I think what's interesting, um, you know, in anticipation of coming on and talking about this, I reached out to a lot of those uh, voters that, that voted for Obama and then voted for them and said, hey, do you think about this? They actually welcome this because they feel as though this, this will j is just either get this out of the way and, and he'll be proven to be not, you know, ha have any problems or that he will have problems and it's time to to move on and and there was sort of this, uh, the, that same sense of relief that you're talking about that you're hearing on Capitol Hill I thought that was pretty fascinating 
All right. Thank you all very much. I want to go now for more reaction here from Capitol Hill. Republican Congressman Leonard Lance from New Jersey. Congressman, uh, what do you say? Are you joining uh, the, the chorus of so many who say Bob Mueller is, is, is an excellent choice, or do you have reservations? Uh, I have no reservations at all, Aaron. And uh, I think that the Deputy Attorney General made a fine decision today, and I support him in his decision. Now, we know the White House, as, as you know, Congressman, has come out with a very brief statement from the President saying he says this will exonerate him. Uh, but obviously, the White House here has, has been hit day after day, late in the day, in the past few days, right, with uh, the classified information that the President shared, with the Comey memos. Now, with this, uh, one official telling us they're letting the news still sink in. What does the White House need to do next? Are you, are you sitting there afraid that the President's going to lash out on Twitter? Uh, no, I, I am not, and I thought that the d statement from the White House was very reasoned, and mm -hmm. um, I hope that the White House will cooperate fully, not only with uh, the investigation by the special counsel, but also, Aaron, with the investigations that are occurring here on Capitol Hill in both of the intelligence committees, and I think they're working in a bipartisan capacity as well as in the decision that's now been made by the Deputy Attorney General. When it comes to the memo, which, which appears to be, given the timing, given that on Friday Rod Rosenstein was telling people close to him he didn't think there was need for a special prosecutor, now here we are on Wednesday, 24 hours after we found out about these memos, and we have a special prosecutor. Who do you believe? Jim Comey says the president told him to end the investigation into General Michael Flynn. The president says it's categorically untrue. As of now, all we know is that there is a memo from Jim Comey attesting to his version of that conversation. Who do you believe? Um, I want to get to the bottom of this situation, and I think that's why it's important that uh, Mr. Comey be involved, and I hope he testifies before Capitol Hill, and I hope that the Justice Department can get to the bottom of it now through the special counsel. And Congressman, do you support whatever it is that Bob Mueller may choose to do? Because this could take him wherever it takes him, right? Would you support him if he says, I want Donald Trump's tax returns? That's just, just one example. Would you full, uh, full heartedly support that? Uh, I, I support uh, the independence of the special counsel. As uh, your legal correspondent, uh, Jeff Tubin points out, mm -hmm. this will take some time because uh, uh, it's uh, a matter uh, traditionally that takes uh, several years, and so I don't think that this will be resolved particularly quickly. I'm sure that Mr. Mueller will be thorough in his investigation. Mm -hmm. And we shall see. Of course, I know you're saying it takes longer. Others are saying it could, it could happen much more quickly than that. Uh, that is in Bob Mueller's hands now. Thank you very much, Congressman Lance. I appreciate Thank your you. time. And John Avalon, I think what we're hearing tonight, obviously, is, is something very rare on any of us, which is an incredible bipartisan yeah. uh, chorus of support for Bob Mueller. Yeah. It's Does that last? Well, it's going to see how quickly the, in, the investigation escalates, how much it makes mm -hmm. Republicans uncomfortable. And the fact that just a few days ago, Republicans outside the administration were saying there's no need for a special counsel. And now there's palpable relief. The decision has been made, and the person in charge is somebody who's above political reproach. But now the process has been set in motion. And what comes out with subpoena powers and other investigatory powers this is going to get big. This is going to answer a lot of unanswered questions. These are going to be fascinating days in our republic. Very fascinating days in our republic, and, and we all hope that while uh, it, it goes to every detail, it does happen quickly. We do have more elections coming up, uh, much more broadly than the Trump part of this investigation, uh, the investigation into Russia's interference in our elections. Anderson Cooper's next.